Martin. I'm in IT services and I, I'm actually a, a Loughborough student. I've been hanging around here since 1988, so I, I know the place pretty well. Um, what I wanted to do today was uh, talk about... Oh, oh, and I've, I've been defeated by PowerPoint. The spinning beach ball of doom. Let me, let me try killing it and starting again. I thought I'll, I'll do PowerPoint because I, I can actually do PowerPoint slides just to prove that I, I don't always use Google Docs. I, I've come unstuck this time. Let's try that one again. So, what we've been doing lately is we've been working on this thing that we call My Elbro, which some of you will have seen. And the idea behind that site was that um, as a Loughborough student, your stuff is just scattered around all over the place, not just physically, but electronically as well. So we were thinking, well, how, how can we bring it together? We gave everybody iGoogle a couple of years ago, and iGoogle is great, but we, we don't get a lot of control over it. It's just kind of there. And you can assemble your iGoogle page with all the public internet content you like. But it's very hard for us to get university-type content onto it. So we built this this My Elbro site, and it's got a bunch of good stuff on it, I, I think, and, and it'd be interesting to, to hear your views on that if you've tried it. Um, it's got a, a bunch of stuff which is all fairly obvious, and then there's a few things that we just didn't actually have online. So um, trivial stuff around how much money you've got, how can I tell how much printer credits I've got, what's on my ID card, now I've got cash on my ID card, or how much is there. Um, you had to scrabble around to find this stuff, and now we've we kind of brought it all together and put it into one place. And something new, and I hope to actually get this out before Christmas, is a, a mobile version of it. And you might say, is that an app? There's a clue down here. So that that's actually uh, a web page which is disguised as an app, and it uses uh, a jQuery framework to, to give it that sort of styling to look like an app and if you actually try it it feels very appy, there's lots of nice transition effects and things. But fundamentally you visit that site from an Android device or an iPod or an iPhone and we're going to show you this, this mobile view and hopefully we'll get that out in time for Christmas, that's the plan. Um, I wanted to talk about how we did all that but I also thought it would be probably relevant to say a, a little bit about the background. And I'm, I'm a pointy-haired boss now, so I'm allowed to use the, the PHP. Um, back in the 90s, I was a researcher here. We were researching kind of networked information systems. And it was before the Facebooks and the Googles, and in actually just about the time Yahoo were getting started. And everyone thought, wow, this internet, it, it could be really big one day. What could we do with it? And little did we realize how big it would be this, you know, short, short time later. <coughs> one of the things that I was involved with was indexing websites. And you, you could say, oh, well, you know, Google have got that pretty much licked now. We thought that the way website indexing would work, and this is just goes to show how wrong you can be, we thought everyone would build their own little index and then they'd share it with other people. And we actually set this up across the whole of AC UK, and this little map shows the different parts of the country where people were aggregating these indexes that were being produced locally. So bottom left-hand corner at Loughborough, we were aggregating the, the website indexes of all the East Midlands universities. And this is all exciting stuff. And um, now it looks kind of quaint and, and bizarre, you know, why, why on earth would you want to do that? But back then there, there wasn't an index and if you wanted to search across university websites, I think this is probably around about the time that Alta Vista got started, which, which uh, this is probably around about the time some of you were born. Um, the key point about this though isn't, isn't to say, hey, look, we did all these things in the 90s. We, we had a particular idea about how stuff would fit together, and it was about protocols and formats for exchanging metadata and this kind of thing. And, and really, what I'm going to come on to later on is how we do that kind of thing nowadays. And some of you will probably already be quite familiar with this, so you, you can tell me wh where I'm going wrong. But if you're not, then um, hopefully it will be useful. So back, back in the day, the protocols and the formats that we used to exchange things like that, web index info, 
completely different really from anything that we're using now. And it was a great experiment, it's all been thrown away. And we did all kinds of complicated architectures. This is my, my favorite. This, this was the ultimate architecture diagram that had every internet protocol, every metadata interchange format, everything that anybody could be trying to squirt around on the network. I don't, don't think we got a date on that one, but that's, that's probably about 99, 2000. And, and at that point, people still had this idea that we'd use lots and lots of different network protocols. And, and nowadays, pretty much we use HTTP. We want to get something from one place to another. We tend to stick it on something that looks a bit like a web server, fetch something that looks a bit like a URL, and get stuff back. And typically that stuff is, is an XML document or a, or a JSON document. And I've got some examples in a bit. Um, other things that we did that were kind of interesting at the time and now look rather bizarre is building little virtual internets on top of the real one. So we were doing a couple of things. Uh, IPv6. Is anybody aware of IPv6? So it's been the, the next big thing for like 10 plus years now. We were, we were part of the, the early experimental IPv6 network called the Sixbone back in about 1996. So you, you kind of think that really is a long time ago. I have got the t-shirt as well. It's funny looking at your, your goodies here because I, I've got the t-shirt that says, you know, list of Sixbone sites and and there we are in, in 1996. And we did something similar with IP multicast, which is what this diagram here is. So all across the world, there are hundreds of sites that are connected up to, it, I guess in modern day terms, you probably call it a dark net, but it's a kind of internet overlaid on top of the real internet. And I think for folk who are doing computer science type stuff, it's really interesting to think about the fact that, you know, your, your provider gives you certain things, but that doesn't stop you from running other stuff on top of it. And these days, typically, it's people running things like proxies and VPN servers so that, let's say, you're in China, but you can actually see content that's censored if you're in China and so on and so forth. Or you can watch uh, BBC iPlayer streams when you're in the States because a friendly UK person lets you use their proxy. So this is all good stuff. For me personally, um, doing that research coincided with the internet taking off and with something that, that seems quite bizarre now, which was um, bandwidth charging. Around about the tail end of the 90s, the internet was really taking off. Bandwidth was still very expensive. And you used to have to pay a small fortune for it. And, and universities actually had to pay by the byte for what they transferred. And a big spike on that diagram there is where peer-to-peer -peer file sharing took off. And we were sitting there, we, we were going, right, okay, websites, yeah, and there's some of the other protocols on there. NNTP, does anybody know what that was used for? Does anybody still use it? So that was the Usenet News um, interchange protocol. So news, Usenet News servers would use that to talk to each other, and Usenet readers would use it to talk to the servers. But huge amounts of traffic, as we thought at the time, and then Napster was invented, and then we really watched it go whoosh. So that was a, a graph from I think that's May '98. Um, everyone said, well, "What are we going to do about all these all these challenges?" We actually had quite a big thing going on around the web, which was um, based on building caching proxies, which you also sometimes get on uh, broadband networks. People like Virgin Media will use them. So you're browsing the web and transparently behind the scenes the pages that you're fetching are being cached in upstream ISP's uh, caching proxy system. And we used to run one of those for the entire country for all of the universities and colleges. And at that point, which is you know, that's around about 2000, that was the biggest site on the Janet network. So it's interesting to think how things have changed now. If you said to people, we're going to put these boxes in the way in between you and the internet, probably not be too keen on that. I and mean, your, your ISP might do it and you don't really have any control over it, but no one's really setting out consciously in, in, in this community to do anything like that anymore. But it was good for me, it paid my mortgage off, so I, I can't complain. Um, again, for me personally, I got into networking, so that was our first gigabit network at Loughborough, and, and I was one of the people that put that in. A bit later on now, this is, this is the current network, that was 10 plus years ago, right now, 
we've gone from a gigabit network to a 10 gigabit network. We've got 10 gigabit internet connections, and it's all pretty high powered. Um, lots of other things haven't really changed, though. So it's kind of interesting, as I, as I do this talk, it may be interesting to think about what, what hasn't changed in the time that you've been using the internet, which things have and haven't. And my personal favorite, I was the project manager for the project to put the wireless network in around campus. So I guess this is probably about five years ago we started doing it. And you look at it now, that's a heat map that uh, some CompSci guy constructed in conjunction with our, our wireless guys, overlaid on top of uh, Google Earth. So we've got all the buildings of the university and the heat map shows which buildings got the most wireless use in them. It's pretty, pretty impressive project. I, I might show you a live demo of it later on. Um, took that snapshot around about lunchtime and, and I was thinking, you know, which buildings are going to be glowing red hot? And I was quite surprised that the library wasn't and the students' union. And the one that really is glowing red hot there is James France. So I guess everybody must go down there for a sandwich and a coffee and really hit the wireless um, for all it's worth. But it's, it's interesting stuff. So, so we started out with just a couple of buildings there. And, and after about two or three months, everyone just expected wireless to be everywhere. And they started complaining and saying, well, I'm, and I'm sat in my hall of residence next to this wired network socket. I can't get on the wireless. It's, it's rubbish. So over a period of several years, we've, we've now put wireless in just about everywhere. And there's a kind of interesting question, do you, do you bother putting wired network sockets in anymore? What do you put them in for? Do you, do you put them in to plug things like projectors into? Uh, do you actually need them for people carrying laptops around? Maybe, maybe you don't. Um, something else I've, I've done more recently, I, I, for my sins, was the person that got Google Apps in here. So when you're using your student Gmail, if it works well and you like it, you can thank me. And if it doesn't work, you can curse me. Um, Earlier on this year, we got uh, Google in to do a street view tour around campus. So here's a quick pop quiz. Who knows where that picture on the left is? Very good. Did anybody else know where it was? Ah, right. I was kind of curious because we're based over there now, and there's a lot of talk about, well, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of its own campus, really. It's its own site away from the main university. And I was wondering how many people had kind of even been over there or had, you know, had a reason to go over there. But there, there is the, the street view guy. So this poor guy spent the best part of a week cycling around campus and every little alleyway and byway he's, he's been up there. The results are pretty impressive. And something I thought would be nice to do with them, now we've got all this imagery around campus, is actually make a 3D campus. So I've done a rather cheesy hazel grave building here. Um, I don't think it would take an awful lot of effort to make a few more. And um, okay, some of them are a bit harder because they've got you know, curves and overhanging bits and what have you. I, I was lazy and I chose a square one. <laughs> um, but it's, it's not hard to do. That took me a couple of hours. So if, you, if you're bored over Christmas and the mince pies have run out, then, you know, could, could be fun. But that's, that's all the digression, really. I, I thought I'd say a few words about that stuff to give you an idea about where I'm coming from. Um, I was talking about earlier on the, the, the formats and the, the interchange protocols and what have you. And... Back in the 90s, we were kind of working these things out as we went along, and we'd just go away and make one up. And quite often, we'd write RFCs about it, and we'd say, look, we've made this protocol up. Does anybody else want to use it? Is it any good? And what's really happened since the web exploded is that thing that I said earlier on, that people will just say, oh, yeah, I need to share some stuff with some people. I need, I need, a, I need a protocol. And what they end up doing is saying, um, what's around there already? There's things like RSS and Atom, which he used for syndicating news feeds principally. And everybody and every, anybody has overridden those to add extra stuff on. And that's what I'll show you some examples of. If you peeked at the slides already, then you, you'll, you'll know it gets quite dense in a slide or two. The interesting thing for me is, we're there saying we're going to use the mechanics of HTTP. We, we send a request for a URL, we get stuff back, it's tagged with a content type, that, that's all fine. But often people will say, oh, you know, it would be great to have a picture in, in this thing that I'm sending back. I'll just stick some HTML in. 
So you've got this concept that you're, you're going off and you're fetching stuff which is going to be used programmatically. This isn't stuff that you as an end user would type into your browser. It's stuff that systems fetch from other systems. And back it comes with, let's say, Unicode characters in it, embedded HTML. Maybe the character set isn't explicitly tagged, so you have to try and figure out what character set you're getting back. And there's lots of these little wrinkles in and nuances. So here's a, a practical example. You may recognize this RSS feed. Um, so there's, there's the Computer Society RSS feed and the, the point of that actually is it's, it's fairly obvious. You can look at that and you can say well you know I don't know necessarily for sure but I'm fairly confident that title is the title and those things about dates and what have you, you know, they're probably dates and you know, pub date could well be the, the published date, the date that this thing was last published. It's all fairly obvious and, and, and easy to follow. And then you, you can actually go onto a particular item in the feed, and here we are with cake. So, this is good. <laughs> um, cake is good, and I don't know who's Lord Infamy. Is Lord Infamy here today? Uh, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> Um, but again, you, you look at it and, and it's, it's fairly obvious what's going on there. There's it's no big mysteries. But what I'll show you in a minute is how, how the RSS Atom newsfeed syndication format has been uh, run away with by people to do all kinds of other stuff. But in practical terms, on that my Elbro site that I showed you, we're using that stuff right now to just slurp together lots of different feeds from places. So we have a script that pulls these RSS feeds from a bunch of sources, does a bit of sifting and sorting, and says, right, well, you know, here's some current news, here's some breaking news, if you like. And this it's not hard to do. And and those are public data sources. So you know you can go to the student union website, you find the little RSS icon, which I think I had on that that slide. Little um, wibbly thing in the, in the top right hand corner there, find the RSS icon, you can grab that feed, it's an XML document, you can parse it in umpteen different languages, Perl, PHP, Ruby, anything like that, and you can go off and, and build things with it. Um, but then, here's the clever bit. This is where people like Google, Yahoo, Microsoft and the rest of them have taken that underlying approach and they've built stuff on top of it. And this is our Google Docs widget in my Elbro. So this uses a Google API, and it uses this wonderful thing called two-legged OAuth. And I think whoever dreamed that one up was probably, I don't know, after, after a few beers maybe. And two-legged OAuth is like the OAuth that you see when you authorize an application to, say, use your Twitter account. But it's a kind of admin override. So we come in and say, we actually run this Google domain, we've got the, the necessary credentials to prove that we do, show us person X's Google documents, don't show us our own, show us this other stuff. And that's how we build the MyAlbro site essentially, we come in and say well actually we run this system, we run that one, we've got admin credentials to let us in. So how does it work in practice? It's, it's actually very similar to fetching the RSS feed from the, from the Computer Society site. We just send a GET request, an HTTP GET request. We stick a few parameters in. There's a, a lovely authorization, OAuth, etc., etc., etc. That's actually how we say we're in charge of this domain. Come on, let us in. But I've I've done some clever substitution. You can you can imagine X, Y, and Z are the actual credentials that you would be passing, and some of those are time limited. You know, only valid for a short period of time. But basically, we send a request for a URL. So we say, get URL, and here's some proof that we're, we're kosher. And you can do this for your own data feeds. So, you know, in, for instance, in Google Docs, you have your own data feed, which you can play with. So you can write code that manipulates the Google API, <coughs> fetches your own stuff. And you can do what you like with it. You know, later on, you could, you could send it back to me and say, I've done this great thing with Google Docs. Do you want to have a think about releasing it to everybody? And because you can do it with your own version of this, just authenticating as you, everything else is the same for everybody. And this is the power of this so-called RESTful approach, which is where you fetch a URL, get a bunch of 
of content back. The URL is kind of the verb. We're saying get, but we could say post or put to update stuff. Um, in practical terms, a bit of PHP here. I, I managed to squeeze it all onto one slide by kind of collapsing the line breaks, but um, you can see there's a bit of XXX and YYY there, which is again obfuscating our, our admin credentials. And there's a URL. So in terms of you know, how do I construct this complicated HTTP request? Actually, you don't have to. PHP, Zen library, pretty good way of doing it. As computer scientists, you're entitled now to go, I don't know about that PHP. That's, that's a bit, uh, bit cheap and nasty, that really. We should be using Haskell or something like that for this. Um, I'll, I'll leave that as an exercise for you. If you want to implement this in Haskell, go, go off and, and have a crack at it. Um, but the point being, you can, you can crib that stuff. So you don't have to be doing all of this fancy um, two-legged OAuth to pretend to be somebody else. You can just be you, and, and it's very easy to find examples of how to do that. Now what you get back, and I apologize that I had to make the, the fonts quite small on this one, what you get back is something that looks very similar to the news feed that we got from the Computer Society site, except instead of uh, just title and published and what have you, there's a bunch of other bits and what they've done is essentially embraced and extended the RSS and Atom format. Atom was meant to be the sort of successor to RSS. Google loved Atom, they've kept adding things to it and in particular um, here's the bottom half of that entry, there was so much of it, this is just for one document, there was so much of it it wouldn't fit onto one screen and you can see things in there which are fairly obvious author's name, who last updated it, and their details. This is this is all nice stuff, but you can see there's lots of GD colon blah, and there's things like docs colon blah, and those are called namespaces. So what, what Google and the rest of them have done is they've come along and taken something that was nice and simple. We went back a few slides, you'll remember it just said things like title and link and author, and it was very simple and obvious. The namespaces mean that you can say, right, this is all stuff related to Google Docs, and the, you've got GD, colon, whatever. Um, that means that you can extend this format indefinitely. And on the, t well, let's see, have I got it? Uh, I haven't got it on here, sorry. If we were loading that feed up, right at the top, there'd be a little thing that says which XML schemas are being used. So you can look at it and say, right, this pulls in Google calendars or you know this pulls in a Facebook API or whatever the schema tells you what elements are valid in that document so bottom line is even allowing for that you can just look this stuff up on the web so you could go away right now and you could search for GD colon last modified it'll take you straight into the Google API documentation which explains what all of these fields actually are so it's very easy and without any special admin privileges it's very easy for you guys as computer scientists to, to take not just Google Docs, a lot of cloud services have these kinds of APIs which you as an end user have some level of access to. So another example is with Twitter, you get an RSS feed for free. Everybody's Twitter feed has an accompanying RSS feed and let's say you take, perhaps Google Docs isn't the best example, but let's say you take stuff that's coming out of one of these sources, stuff that's coming out of another one, stick them together and there's lots of interesting opportunities there. Perhaps, as I say, not with Google Docs and, and Twitter RSS feeds, but maybe with some other stuff. And I, I've got an example of that in a minute. So I did the same thing to show you a preview of your email. And again, there's a, a URL that we can fetch. We get one of these Atom feed documents pack, which is just a title, author, some links, some attributes. Except this time around, it's your email. And and similarly for your calendar. So that one approach, once we've mastered it, we can use it again and again and again. Some of the elements will be called different things. Oh, fair enough. You'll be having to figure out which URL you need to send your request to to get this stuff back. Again, fair enough. Well, the underlying approach is the same. So we were able to do, uh, wherever we are now, <laughs> Google Docs, Gmail, Calendar, 
And there's a couple of other things in, in the wings to do, uh, Google Groups and Sites, and basically all of that family of services, you, you get to them in much the same way and you can get your, your stuff out of them in much the same way. Um, some of the other stuff that you see on the site is, is done in a bit more traditional, conventional way, which is, okay, Fred has a database. Dear Fred, please can I have access to a view of your database that shows you the stuff that we want to present to people on the site. And around the university, there's umpteen systems and databases that we've, we've tapped into. And case in point here is Learn, which is uh, based on a Moodle software running on Linux. Moodle is written in PHP uses a MySQL database and again is open source so if you guys are playing around on Learn and you're thinking oh you know this is this is bloody rubbish I could do better than that you can actually change it and and it would be really interesting to hear back from people who who have played with the Moodle source this summer we're probably going to be moving to Moodle 2 which is the latest and greatest so if anybody wanted to try and uh, come up with like a project idea based around Moodle 2 or something like that um, you know there's there's interesting opportunities there um, some of our other systems are based on less obvious technology though so um, give you give you some examples um, some some of our systems have no API whatsoever and no documentation for the database so these aren't Mickey Mouse systems these are in some cases they're market leaders and the vendors have actually said hmm why would we want to do something like that why could we what on earth would make us want to provide an API database schema documentation or any of that stuff we want to sell you consultancy and, and you're never going to buy it if you can build your own stuff. So this is what you'll, you'll probably find if you've worked out in industry or you, when, you, when you graduate and you work out in industry, you'll be thinking, right, oh, well, it, it, surely it could only be a couple of hours work to hook up a feed from the, the HR system or the finance system or something. And, and the answer will be, <laughs> no, 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 we've, we've talked to them about that. And, you know, get somebody in at a thousand pounds a day after the point where you've decided exactly what it was that you wanted out of the system and then they will build it for you and they won't give you the source code or anything like that. So that, that's, how, that's how things used to be but increasingly the systems that we're, we're buying have web services APIs like the sort of thing I've just been showing you. So there's a lot of the old stuff out there but most of the new stuff is coming with APIs that you can use to do these kinds of mashups. Um, case in point, the ID card system, uh, everybody now has a, a MIFA classic chip, again for better or for worse, embedded in their ID card. That's got purses on for Cash Plus and Dyna Plus, and there's APIs that the vendor provides that let us get in there, view your balance, uh, update your balance. So there's a, there's a challenge for a computer scientist. How would, I, how would I get to update my balance on my ID card? How would I do that? Where is the database and what would I need to send it? Hopefully it's so well hidden that you'll never find it. Um, but we also built some APIs of our own. <laughs> he's, he's there, I've done it already. <laughs> if you look at my card, it's got 9,000 pounds on it. Um, some of our systems we, we built our own APIs for. So the, the guys who run the library system said, well, oh, this doesn't actually look that hard. And, you know, the, the stuff I was showing you just now, they said, well, <coughs> we could generate that. And they actually did. They, they went away, it wasn't quite over a weekend, but it was over maybe two or three days. I'd said to them, on, the, on this site, it would be great if we could show people X, Y, and Z. So what books have you got out? Are any of them overdue? Have any of them been recalled? And this kind of thing. Are there any fines outstanding? And they said, well, yeah, we think we know where all of that stuff is. We'll write you an API. So they went away and they wrote uh, a RESTful API that we can call and we can say, we're after Fred Bloggs's um, library borrower details and it gives us all that info. So this is the kind of thing I, I think you guys are, are ideally placed, you know, either here as projects or when, when you leave, to be getting in there and saying, look, there's a system that we can open up as computer scientists, we, we know how these things work. So if we get the database schema or we get you know enough information about this piece of software, we can open it up and, and you know we can do more stuff with it. So that pointy air boss time again. That's all very well, but but what does it actually mean in practice? So we we built this site 
It uses some cloud APIs, it uses some local stuff that we built ourselves, it uses some stuff from vendors. And uh, this was built as a cloud computing talk, and what I was really getting at in a roundabout way is that the, the cloud isn't just something that you get off on the internet from Facebook or whoever, the, the, or Amazon. The cloud is actually something that, for, for enterprises, is a, is a bit internal and a bit external. And where computer scientists really fit in, I think, is to, is to glue the bits together. So you've got a bunch of stuff that you bought in. Maybe some of it is externally hosted. Maybe some of it you run yourselves. How do you actually fit it all together? If you want to get feeds out of one system into another, um, how does that work? And, and I think that's really where there are an awful lot of opportunities for computer scientists right now. Um, pra practical terms, um, we've got something I, I'm going to gloss over, which is a huge topic called single sign-on. So gloss over that, it's, it's uh, quite complicated, so we haven't got time to talk about it today. But the, the, the rough concept is when you visit that website, you're presented with a login prompt if you've not already visited your Gmail. And having logged into that site or logged into your Gmail or a bunch of other sites that are part of this system, you get a cookie on your browser. And you also get um, a session remembered on our single sign-on server. So simple stuff. There's a protocol involved there, which is another one of these XML wrapped up in web requests thing. So that's called SAML. Again, very interesting topic for anybody going into kind of corporate enterprise IT. I've got umpteen different systems. How can I avoid having to log in separately to each one, have separate passwords for each one? So search for something called Shibboleth, search for something called SAML, and there's a, there's a whole world of interesting stuff there, and very few people understand that. So it's a good growth, growth area. Um, that web page that I showed you is actually populated using a bunch of Ajax callbacks. So you load, you load the page up and you get lots of empty boxes and little twirly widgets in each one of the boxes as the content is loaded. And that's that we're trying to be kind of modern. We could have just waited and, until we actually had loaded all the content up and shown it to you. But we thought we'd try and do it in a, in a kind of Web 2 way. But the interesting question there is, when we tell the whole world about this, because right now we've been fairly circumspect about it, but we suddenly find that we can't load the data up quickly enough. You know, if 500 people all want to view this site in the course of five minutes, is that not going to work? Um, and that's where we get into things like intermediate caching and you know, do we need to take a copy of the stuff that's coming back from these various data feeds. Right now the approach that we're taking is very much Fred has come along, we want to fetch Fred's library loans, we want to Fred, fetch Fred's card balance. And if that approach doesn't scale when we have um, more than the sort of five, six hundred people a day using this site right now that we, that we have at the minute, then we need to take the stuff that's in these various systems and databases and have an intermediate caching layer. I said at the beginning about the web proxies and how 10 plus years ago we were caching content because international bandwidth was really expensive. There's a whole different way of looking at that which is I've got something that looks a bit like a web document which is actually the result of calling a service on a remote machine. And it could be something like the library API. We could be saying to the library, I like Fred Bloggs's lender details. What books has he got out? When are they due back? Etc. Etc. If you're a web device, if you're something like a, an Apache proxy server or a squid server, that's just some content. So if it turns out that the approach we're taking right now, which is um, load all this stuff up as you visit the page, if it turns out that doesn't scale, then actually putting a web proxy in between this site and the places that we're fetching things from, and this only works for the web data, it doesn't work for the, the MySQL connections and, and what have you, um, we can actually trivially cache all of the content that's coming back. So we can say, okay, Fred Bloggs's library record, yeah, okay, that will be in the cache for half an hour without having to rewrite this whole application. And that's one of the benefits of, of this sort of overall web approach to designing information systems. Uh, that, that's, that's probably quite a complicated concept to get across, and I'm afraid I didn't have a diagram for it. So you might have to think about that one and, and, and what it really means. Um, or maybe I'll try and do a diagram. I'll try and do a blog post about this one, because um, there's a lot of 
interesting concepts that I'd, I'd like to get across. Um, there are some traps for the unwary though. Character sets is a good one. We, we had it going for a while, seemed, seemed fine, and then I created a document with a Japanese title in Google Docs, and I looked at it on the portal page, the MyOlboro page, and it was gibberish. And I suddenly thought, yeah, we've not really considered internationalization at all here. And the good, good message for anybody building web apps is just to assume that Unicode, UTF-8, is the standard. Everything should be Unicode aware, and then you won't be caught out. This isn't to say that some people don't use other Unicode character set variants, but UTF-8 is the, is the big one. Um, I mentioned about polluted um, content, things like RSS feeds with lots of embedded uh, rubbish in them. And I've already seen that with, with the PHP XML parser. Sometimes that, that thing will get back some XML that it doesn't quite like. And rather than saying, that looks a bit dodgy to me, the default behavior is for it to buff. So it'll raise an exception. And if you are trying, if you are assuming that the XML would parse, you are disappointed. And if you were not doing sufficient error checking on the results of parsing the XML, those Atom feeds and RSS feeds I was talking about, then your app crashes. And you know, in terms of populating the widgets on, on the My Elbro page, maybe you just see a blank box. Because And this actually happened to me the other day. I realized I didn't have enough error checking on the, on the library part of that site. We fetched back the list of library books, and I'd taken out a library book. It was written by a Russian guy whose name has accents on some of the characters. And the XML parser in PHP said, whoa, well, what the hell that is? <laughs> I'm just going to bomb out at this point. So that's, obviously, people talk about any, any app that gets input from the user over the web and how you need to validate the input that you get from an end user. But there's something similar about the the system to system communications that we're talking about here. How much trust do you want to place in the system that you're fetching a data feed from? You know, be it a cloud system or a local system, maybe even something that somebody down the corridor from you has written. You should probably treat them as hostile, just to be on the safe side. And it, you know, it's not that they're inherently hostile. It's just that. Fred was having a bad day when he wrote that particular bit of code and he'd forgotten to think about character sets and encodings or what have you. Bang, he's blowing your stuff up. So there's, there's my, my hints and tips really. The two-legged OAuth thing I mentioned is interesting to bone up on if you, unfortunately you have to actually create a, a Google Apps domain which you have API access to which I think means you probably would have to pay for it. You can create a free domain but I don't think you have the API access to those. If you do learn about it you'll be in the company of a very small number of people because very few people understand how that stuff works which is a roundabout way of saying that you, you could earn an awful lot of money and I, I think, I haven't tested this theory out yet but if, I, if I'm seen driving around in a Ferrari in the next few months, then you'll know I'm right. Um, I talked about REST, which is this concept that you you exchange data with people by sending something that looks like a web request, get URL, HTTP 1.1, headers, get back something like an XML document. There's an earlier uh, version of this, which is something called SOAP. Has anybody come across SOAP? So SOAP was um, um, but much more complicated, essentially remote procedure calls over HTTP. Lots of vendors seized on it as, as right, you know, we are web enabling our stuff. But SOAP is insanely complicated because you have to know exactly what all of the things that you could possibly send from one end to the other are in order to communicate. So you need to exchange all of this information about the services that are available, what they can send back, etc, etc. So my message is if you can avoid SOAP, do. <laughs> and similarly there's a lot of thinking right now that um, XML is a horribly complicated way of saying title, blah, link, blah. And there's something called JSON and I'm, I'm guessing a few people here from the nods know what JSON is. So JSON is a, is a JavaScript compatible encoding of stuff. So you can essentially get a JSON response back from a server, possibly in the browser, through, um, through an AJAX request. You can get this 
uh, JSON response back, which you can instantiate directly in the browser or trivially in any scripting language. So something like PHP, you can just send a URL request and slurp back the results straight into an array in PHP. So for anything that involves um, user preferences for websites or something like that, you can, you can fill out your data structure in PHP send it straight back to a database, send it to some web service somewhere to store, and you don't need to worry about breaking out all of the individual elements and, you know, let's say it is user preferences, uh, what color background did they have, what image did they want to use, what font size did they like. Don't worry about any of that, just say, right, I want to save this particular array here, and the JSON encoding will, will take care of it for you. So JSON, very good. But again, like, like SOAP, a lot of people are wedded to the idea that if I'm doing this kind of thing, it has to be an XML, there have to be angle brackets, or it's not a, a proper approach. So I, I think what we'll see is increasingly where people offer a, a choice, like Google do right now, for instance, um, they'll move to offering only JSON. And with a lot of the, the newer Google APIs, like Google Plus API, there's no choice, it is JSON. So that, that's my, my tip for the top. And also, <laughs> debugging. If you want to debug this stuff, in PHP there's a lovely command called print underscore r which will give you all of the HTTP responses and requests and, and a chapter and verse about something. You wouldn't want to fill your entire code with this stuff, but if you're having problems with something, you can print underscore r and you will just get everything that you need to know to understand what's going on on the wire. And that that can be a little complicated to do any other way because a lot of these requests nowadays are being encrypted. So in terms of how do I encrypt and decrypt stuff, you can do that with Wireshark if you're, if you're familiar with it, but doing it natively inside the scripting language is, is probably easier. And I, I've mentioned Data Dumper there, which is a Perl thing, because I'm old school and I, I still like Perl. Does anybody like Perl here? I'm curious. So if we, a couple of people have, yeah, might admit to it, um, and I mentioned PHP. Yeah, I kind of assume that everybody's had some level of exposure to PHP who would come along to something like this. Is, is that right? And any any Ruby enthusiasts? Haskell? <laughs> I I couldn't let it lie. Nobody's really enthusiastic about that, are they? Mm. Um, yeah. Okay then. So. Closing thoughts, and I, I've talked for a bit longer than I meant to, so I, sorry about that. Um, I said cloud services are kind of permeating everywhere. Here's a good case in point. The, the new library um, catalog system that was introduced this summer doesn't live on site. It lives entirely out um, uh, in the supplier's um, cloud, if you like. But it talks to on-site systems. So there's an on-site system that the librarians run that actually tracks which books are out, which books have been returned, which ones are overdue, and all, all of the all of the boring day-to-day -day stuff, which you actually have to do to run a library. And, and, and that's for me, is a good case in point of how these things all come together. We don't really want to have to run that entire system, which indexes the full text of all of the library subscriptions that we've got. It's great, you, know, you can go off and search the full text of all of the journals that we're subscribed to with one single query. It's absolutely brilliant. But we don't want to have to do that. We don't want to have to have a huge pile of disks somewhere sitting whirring away just so that we can have that full text index. So it's great that the suppliers are offering us things like this. And then there's the role for the computer scientist in kind of systems integration. How do we get people logged into it with uh, university IDs? How do we, um, in this case, how do we get that information back and forth about which books are out, who's forgotten to bring their book back, how much they owe now, and all that stuff. So I think we'll see more and more of that. Um, here's another example that goes in the opposite direction, really, which is um, to do with uh, the new timetabling system. So how many of you knew that you have an online timetable? Did you know that? So there's a web page you can go to that shows you your timetable. I, I got the impression that it hadn't been particularly well advertised, so I was curious. So we've got a link to it on the MyOlbro page, but then the next step, which we, we've just got working in a proof of concept, is to take the data that's in the timetabling system and stick it into a Google Calendar and subscribe people to the calendar for their, for their course. So we've got to figure out a few things around module options and stuff like that, but basically 
look in your calendar in, in a little while, it'll probably be around Easter, I think, realistically, and, whoa, it's got all my courses, and it's got the rooms that I'm having the lecture in, and we could probably do a sort of optional 9am lecture warning, um, give, me, give me half an hour's notice for that one. But I'm very interested in, now that we've, we've proved that we can do this, what other sorts of stuff might be useful to poke, particularly into the calendar, because until we introduced Google Apps, students didn't have a calendar, an online calendar at Loughborough. So you've got a calendar. Right now, everybody puts their own stuff in it. The university doesn't put anything in it. And I was talking to the students' union yesterday about, um, you know, getting events calendars and, you know, clubs and societies calendars and things like that. <laughs> Oh, they're keen, they're keen. So then, then there's obviously things like careers and, you know, some things I could picture the university might say, well, we, we are signing you up to this, you know, your timetable, for instance. You, you will have your timetable in your calendar. But I can see how it might be quite nice for people to be able to go, oh, well, you know, are there are any interesting calendars here. Ah, careers fair calendar, yeah. You know, vendor presentations and stuff. Well, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll come along to those. Um, so that, that's, that's coming. And another one that we've just done is to, and this is quite ambitious, this links together um, the timetabling system to tell us which uh, labs are booked, PC labs, and it links together um, the Active Directory, which is the, the system that manages users and computers for the university, so that when you log in on a computer in a lab, there's a little flag that's updated in the Active Directory to say, oh, so this one's got someone logged into it. And we link that together with the lab, and we link that together with the timetabling system, and we can say, well, you know, I wouldn't go to S006 because, um, you know, there's no way you'll get in there. But actually, you know, there's there's loads of room in, um, I don't know, BE025, as long as you get there before two. And so we've never we never had anything like this before, and and this is an example for me of the kind of things that that we as computer scientists can, can mash up with all these data feeds and, and APIs. So uh, uh, that's going to be part of, of my Elbro, and we're going to probably release that initially to people on their phones, because it's an obvious thing, you know, you're wandering around thinking, where am I going to get a place to sit and use a computer? Well, ah, okay, now, now I can find out the answer to that question. So I'd, hopefully there's some interesting stuff there, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about what we could do, and if you're interested in, in being a part of it, because I'm sure we could find some some projects that, that people could work on if, if they're keen. Um, but I wanted to leave you on a, a bit of a downer here, and this is the, the, the flip side of it all. This is a, a quote from Leslie Lamport. Has anybody come across him? Have you, you've, been, you've been force fed latex at some point, haven't you? So he's he's the, the, the guy that's responsible for that. And um, his, his quote here, a distributed system is one in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. Well, I, I kind of substitute, you know, service or website or something for that. And I think it's just as, as relevant now as it was 20 odd years ago when he wrote it. Um, when we're building these kinds of things, and this may be the, the proof of the pudding will come in the new year when, with, with my Elbro when we've told everybody about it and everybody's hitting the site every five minutes. Um, at what point do things start to break down? And, I, and as I said about defensive coding, I think it probably makes sense to assume that there will be a point when things break down. You know, if you build your site on Amazon Web Services, you've got to be there at the point when you know that all of a sudden your site is getting a lot more popular and you need to throw a lot more servers at it to scale it up. And it's those sorts of things. If you haven't anticipated them or you're not collecting stats, then you don't know that you've reached that point. So that. That's my, my advice as a, as a, a wrinkly computer scientist. <laughs> and I'd love to hear um, what you guys have got to say. So thanks very much for having me today. Um, cheers. And, and any questions, fire away. <laughs> Go for it. With the my other side, yeah. say, saying it's based around what jQuery or loading uh, content, what happens if someone's got JavaScript to save? Well, in, indeed, there are many ways to break the site, and 
you know, you could also find, I should think, that um, some ad blockers would probably cause it problems too. And we're not doing a lot with iframes, which is one of those areas where it's very easy for browser settings to, to break things. And I was consciously trying to avoid using iframes all over the place. But I, I wouldn't be at all surprised. I mean, I didn't mention, actually, that there's an online advertising element to this. So we, we're partnering with a company that does online advertising for people like BT. When you go onto BT Open Zone, you see adverts that they've brokered. And right now we're displaying kind of public service announcements. But if we manage to get some interest from advertisers, then you'll actually be seeing uh, the, the big... In fact, I could probably um, see if I can show it to you. There's a big, big... Um, where are we? There's a big, big thing there which says University Library, and if we actually get some advertisers up, then those those messages, those public service announcements, will turn into, you know, buy the new Samsung phone, or, you know, take a take a nice holiday with SDA travel or whatever, and your ad blocker might well go, ah, ah, ah. I don't want to see that. Um, but it, there's the rub, really. It's it's very hard actually to just devise a site that works in all the main browsers in, in the first place. Or I should say that works in Internet Explorer and all the other browsers, because Internet Explorer is the hard one. So that's been our, our focus so far, really, actually make something that works most of the time for most of the people. Any more for any more? Or do you just want your hoodies? Haha! <laughs> We'll talk about that afterwards. I, I do take payment in cake, actually. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to show you the um, the wireless um, usage thing, because I, th I think this is really smart. And this is an example. I'm not sure whether it was an RA or a research student who did this, but um, the idea is you can fly around this Loughborough campus, and you can see, uh, if I can remember what all the controls are in this, you can see by this color coding um, which buildings have the most wireless use. And I haven't reloaded it for a while, so let's let's see if it all goes horribly wrong now. The it's the number of devices connected. And if I if I manage to persuade it to reload, let's see. <laughs> and, and that's not devices per person either. Uh, let's see, I, I'm having trouble remembering which um, key combinations drive this, but you can see actually it's looking pretty quiet, so I don't know, maybe everybody's kind of evenly distributed going to lectures right now. But it's it's really interesting to see what you can what you can do, you know, potentially. And if people have interesting projects or ideas for what we could do with, um, you know, th some of the stuff that I've, I've shown today, then I, I'd um, love to hear about them, really. And... That's my Twitter ID at the bottom. I, I tend to use Twitter these days in preference to email because um, I get so many emails it's very hard to actually read them all. <laughs> but I was curious about that. Do you guys, do any of you use Twitter or Google Plus or Facebook? Is it everybody on Facebook? <laughs> Nearly everybody. Has anybody, has anybody retired from Facebook or deliberately not joined? <laughs> Yeah, so I'm I'm easily contactable on Twitter if anybody wants to um, throw any any stuff past me. Any any last questions? Well, thanks for having me. And I'll try and I'll try and get the recording. Assuming that it's worked out okay, I'll try and post the recording of this to the forum so it's all kind of nicely wrapped up. And I'd be happy to ask, answer questions on the forum as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.